Okay, hi. Uh, the next talk is going to be held by Chesney Schepler about big data analytics with Python using Stratosphere. Please welcome him. Um, okay, so one thing that I have to raise before is, so before, um, between handing this in this talk and actually having it, the Stratosphere project has been accepted in the Apache Incubator program and had to be renamed due to a naming conflict and it is now known under the name Apache Flink. Flink being a German term for something that is fast or agile. <clears throat> so for the remainder of the talk I refer to it as Flink since um, the feature that we, or the main feature that we are presenting today will be part of our, of the actual, um, our, of one of our first Apache releases. So I'm going to first talk a bit about what Flink in general is, and then um, go more detail about um, our actual reason being here, our new Python API that exposes some features of Flink to Python developers. So what is Apache Flink? It is a distributed runtime for big data analytics, written in Java, um, with a big focus on ease of programming um, by, oper by offering a rich set of operators and um, automatically optimizing your program. The project started in 2009 as a joint research project by several universities here in Berlin and was then later transferred into an open source pro project. It is now moving to Apache under the name Flink. The latest version is 0.52, is the last release outside of Apache, and the uh, next or six releases scheduled between uh, within the next weeks. Flink operates in the same um, use space as systems like Apache Spark or Hadoop MapReduce. It shares common traits like um, scalability and user defined functions, um, but combines these with database technologies like declarativity and optimization. So a lot of decisions, how the system works deep down is um, left to the system. When writing a program, oh, when writing a program for Flink, um, what you're essentially creating is some kind of data flow. So you have data sources and you put operations on them and um, output them somehow. So in this case, we have some data sources. We apply map functions to it, reduce, joins. Um, yes. um, one thing that sets the Flink apart is that these steps are not done step by step. So we don't do the whole map operation and then pass the whole data set that um, is to produce into a reduce function. We stream them on the go into the next operation so that in some cases, your whole program is running at the same time. The Flink stack looks something like this. So at the very ground, you have some um, storage where you have your data. Flink itself does not depend on any uh, distributed file system, so you can work on local files exclusively. Um, HDFS works surprisingly well, or especially well, um, but you can also have your data in uh, databases, for example. For cluster managers, you have also, um, Flink works with several, it's Yarn especially well, once again. Uh, then we have the Flink runtime, um, optimizer and several API APIs built on top of them in different languages. So we have the Java API with our main baseline, Scala, um, Sparkle uh, API for graph computation, Meteor, one in, for JSON, I believe, uh, currently developing an SQL API. And the main reason for, for me being here is our new Python API, which is built on top of the Java API. So one thing that is, um, um, as you pointed out, is that all APIs go through the same optimizer and the same runtime, so they're not, um, so they're kind of very deeply connected with the other. So, <clears throat> in summary, the key features of, of, of Flink are that you have various developer APIs that are easy to use. So when you write a program, you have uh, on the one hand, you write, write the plan inside your API and the user defined functions as well. Some operations are done on the Java side, like grouping and sorting. A lot of the computation is actually done in the API's respective language. Um, 
the optimization takes care, or can sort of how certain operations are carried out, how is the join carried out. Um, it ta takes into account where the operation or operations are carried out physically, so it tries to um, place subsequent operations onto the same machine so that you don't juggle the data across the whole cluster. Uh, the flink runtime is its very own system. It's not built on Hadoop or other systems. And um, something that I haven't touched on earlier is that we treat iterations at first class citizens um, and optimize them separately. So, so much to, uh, for Flink in general, and we're now going to look at the, the Python API. Um, so, this is a word count example. So, you wanna, if you want to know how often each word appears in a text, this is what you would do. So, on the left side, you have, your, you have the plan. Basically, on the right side, you have your user defined functions. So, so let's just go through it step by step. So the first call to get an environment is something like um, I'm writing a new program. Um, some, think of it as like a common root for your, for your program. Uh, we then apply a flat map function to and we first read data. Uh, a text file, so every line is treated as a separate string, and then apply a flat map function to it. We're passing an object of our user defined function um, and the output type. So the output type, while not very Python like um, to have to pass it. Um, this is a side effect of using the Java API underneath. The Java API enforces a very strict type system, so if you would like look at the same program in Java, you would see type arguments little everywhere. Uh, so this is one of the last remnants of that. So um, what the tokenizer does, it splits uh, the, the line into several words and collects them each with an initial count. We then group the data based on the words. We partition all the resulting data and apply a reduce function to each group separately that sums up the words and then writes the data to the CSV file. The call to execute is, as the name implies, starts the plan. So um, when, after the call to read text, data does not contain any data. It is just an absolute abstract representation of the data that will exist once the program is executed. <clears throat> so now, um, why are we interested in Python? Python's already used heavily used, Python's already heavily used in data analytics jobs. Um, so it just seems like a good fit to provide Flink's um, capabilities to Python developers. Um, it also allows Java developers to access Python's extensive standard and machine learning libraries. So in the grand scheme of things, this is how um, the whole process would look like. So you write your code in Python. Um, when it's executed, it creates intermediate representation of your program. It is then funneled through a Java API to create an actual Flink plan, um, which is then shipped across the cluster and executed. So the Python functionality, um, so our use defined functions, are stored as serialized data um, inside these, um, inside the execution graph. <coughs> so that on the runtime, the data flow is something like this. So you have a Flink runtime that encompasses everything. You have a Java operator since the plan is written in Java in internally. You need some um, encapsulating object for the whole Python operation, which when it is, so, so when the operator is started or uh, opened, or created, it starts a Python process, deserializes the object that we passed in the plan, so the tokenizer object in our case, for example, and then pipes the data through um, the user defined function. So when dealing with processes of different languages that exchange data, the type system becomes a natural issue. So what we do currently is, uh, we have a fairly rudimentary system currently, um, we just what we do is, is we map basic types to each other. Um, as well as, uh, as tuples and lists are converted to Flink tuples. So Flink tuples are um, a fixed length type safe container, which um, is somewhat similar to, to Python tuples, um, or similar enough that you can use them. Um, so I said rudimentary, so you can't 
Um, these tablets cannot be nested currently. They can't be um, longer than 24 elements. Um, just time constraints while we haven't gone to that currently. Um, a more severe problem is, of course, that we don't use ar don't allow arbitrary objects, um, which is due to the fact that uh, we want to do it properly. So we could use a pickle uh, module to just pickle uh, the data. If it's not one of these basic types, then unpickle them when I come back. But there are several use cases where this is not um, enough. So for example, if you want to sort on these data or group on them, you end up, um, it won't work since the sort operations are executed on the Java side. So in order to avoid um, really ugly programming patterns, we decided to skip, leave it out for, for a while and um, spend a bit more time on, on these things. So when we say we support arbitrary objects with our Python API, then we actually do. Um, something that's closely related to the protocol is how we exchange tile between uh, these processes, so, uh, so the protocol. Initially, we used the uh, Google protocol buffers for those, uh, for, for this, but they were in the end way too slow for us. So we switched to, to the struct package on the Python side and bypass on the Java side, which works surprisingly well together. Um, so basically right off the box. Um, since we only changed the protocol around three weeks ago, they are, it's um, pretty much designed currently for the, for the tuple, for the flink tuple type and around the current restrictions for the type system. Um, so a few details will most likely change in the, in the future. But um, the gist of it is that we serialize the fields and apply a few um, extra data, independent bit extra data. So for every field, for every field that's serialized, we apply, uh, we add a, a type by to it. Um, this can actually be, re be removed for normal data flow since the output types are always the same. But for now, it's still in there. And then we have this meta byte, this is with it, which is um, on the one end used for several control functions, like I'm the last element in this iterator, or I'm the last element that's collected, or uh, things like subject computation. And then with the size argument, which um, represents the number of elements in your given tuple. So for something that's not a tuple, um, this would um, have a special value to this to use. I'm way too fast. Um, so the Python API is currently provides a subset of the features of the Java API. Um, so you can read data from text files, CSV files, or provide distinct objects within your plan. You can write as text as CSV or CSV files and print them and stand it out. Um, Operation-wise, we actually su support most of them. The most important missing one are iterations. Uh, you couldn't get on time. Um, for the most part, though, is for, for something that you uh, um, is the Python API is currently in a state where you can try it out. It's not production ready. So um, for this testing, it is certainly um, usable. So one thing that we're thinking about is, for example, um, for, for the future, is that in, a, in Scala, in the J, Java API, you have the option of define, or oh no, I'm going to start it differently. The input and output of data is currently completely handled on the Java side by something that we call input formats, which is similar to Hadoop input formats, so they define how certain data is read, how they are um, given to, to Flink. Um, and we want to provide the same functionality on the Python, on the Python API so you can um, read, so that the whole pipeline is completely handled in Python, from data input to transformations to um, data output. Um, so in order to, to, to use the API, you, so we tried it on Linux, um, Ubuntu to be more precise, um, on Python 2.7. We know that there are two minor issues that prevent it to run on Python 3, just to do some type stuff like no, long and base string and all that fun, fancy stuff. 
Um, but it should generally work also in Python 3 with minor modifications. So in order to, to run locally, so you can run it locally just in your um, PC to, to try it out. And all you have to do is basically to download Fling, start it, and you can already run it. So depending on how fast you download and can move to a terminal, um, you can get it up and running in a minute, basically. For the cluster, you need a bit more work, so you have to set up Fling and configure it and all that stuff. Um, as of right now, you, know, you need an HFS that is used to distribute the files among the clusters. So the Fling package, as well as the um, files the user provides, are distributed automatically among the cluster. So um, you don't have to do it manually. This also means that if you make a change on the main node, this change is automatically propagated uh, among the cluster, which is surprisingly convenient. Yeah. So, um, so I hope, I was way too fast. Um, I hope that it could pique your interest a bit in, in Flink. So uh, if you have more, if you want more information, you can go on the website, flink.incubator.apache.org. Um, if you want to try out the Python interface, you can um, go into um, this repository that I set up. Um, it also contains a detailed documentation for the Python API. Um, and um, then I will thank you for your attention. Would you like to take some questions then? Yeah, we have lots yeah. Of time. yeah, if you yeah. have still some time. We left. don't have a microphone here, so you would have to repeat the questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So, do Spark and Stratosphere follow the same kind of strategy? If yes, then what are the differences? Uh, could, could you repeat the second part again? Uh, yeah, no, Spark. Uh, yeah, they, they are similar so systems. Ah, yeah. So the question is, why would I use? Uh, why would should one use Flink um, compared to similar systems like Spark? So um, one thing that we do um, better is that we provide a better interface for iterations, or generally a more efficient one. So we try to use, reuse a lot of operations um, to, pro, to prevent repetitive um, computations. Um, one thing that should be said though is, is, is that Spark is generally more mature currently. Uh, yeah, so it's a tough question, to be honest. Yes, please. Um, so the question was if, if the data is only um, replicated or also partitioned uh, when executing on the cluster. Um, it is, as far as I know, it is partitioned. So the question was, if I um, got it correctly, what, what happens when uh, we need a piece of, if we partition the data and we need to access another partition from another system, what happens then? Um, hmm, I'm actually not sure about that. Yeah. So um, I've never looked at that code, to be honest. Um, I've only been with the project for around three months. Most of the time I worked on, on the Python API. Uh, so I'm not very much informed about the really internal, deep down stuff in the system. <laughs>